Hello once again, everybody. It's Adam Burke, host of the Betters Box at BangTheBook.com. And, you know, recently I've had some requests from my listeners of that podcast and, of course, from the readers of my picks and tips piece, which you can find every day at BangTheBook.com, on how to use fan graphs and how to use Baseball Savant. Also have a screencast video for how to use fan graphs, but Baseball Savant is the one here where we get the next level analysis. A lot of people have been using sabermetric statistics have been using ERA and XFIP for a little while. That's how I got my start with handicapping baseball from a sabermetric standpoint. I still use a lot of those concepts. However, I've added to them. You always have to adapt. You always have to be ready to broaden your horizons, find more information. And for me, that website is Baseball Savant. Darren Willman, part of the StatCast team, does a brilliant and phenomenal job, along with people like Tom Tango, Mike Petrello, you're doing really great things with all of that stat cast information. And fortunately now, a lot of it publicly available for us. And we can use that for handicapping purposes, at least. That's how I use it. And of course, it's a lot of fun usually too, uh, to just look up exit velocities during the game and things like that. So in this screencast video here, we're going to take a look at Baseball Savant, how to use the site, what to look for, and of course, how to run some of those individual queries. So right here on the main page, you get the daily matchups section here. And obviously, pretty self-explanatory stuff. Looking at Jack Flaherty's career performance against the current Cubs roster, John Lester's against the current Cardinals roster, and of course, a much bigger sample size there than we see with Jack Flaherty. But again, team versus pitcher statistics, maybe not the most reliable things because the sample sizes just aren't really significant enough to carry a whole lot of weight. So, what do I use this Baseball Savant data for? Well, let's go up here to the StatCast leaderboard section. We'll go in this player type box and switch that to pitcher. Then we'll go over to update here. And I talk a lot in my podcast, a lot in my picks and tips piece, about exit velocities, about how pitchers suppress hard contact. I mean, think about it. The harder a ball is hit, the harder it is to field, the less likely it is to be fielded. And of course, also, you know, a lot of times higher exit velocities mean extra base hits, doubles, triples, home runs, those really hurtful things for pitchers in today's run environment because we've got a lot of strikeouts nowadays and a lot of home runs. What really hurts is when you start giving up those doubles and triples, start letting teams score runs by you know sort of manufacturing them, hitting behind runners, sacrifice flies, all that kind of stuff. You know, so if you are a pitcher that is capable of suppressing exit velocity, you can have a lot of success, especially if you're a guy who doesn't have the strikeouts to go with it. So one of the things I really like to look at here is I like to sort by this average exit velocity column. Here, of course, we see it in descending order from the hardest average exit velocity against all the way down to the lowest average exit velocity against. So here you can see some people like Eric Skoglin, who's had problems sticking with the Royals throughout the course of the season. Brian Flynn, who's mostly used as a reliever type. Jaime Garcia, a guy with very high uh, run metrics for the Toronto Blue Jays. Matt Moore, another guy that's been hit very hard this season. Mike Leake, another one. So what I like to do here is I generally like to sort from the best to the worst, where we see Brent Suter, currently has the lowest average exit velocity against at 83.8 miles per hour, followed by Anibal Sanchez, then CC Sabathia, Carlos Martinez, Chris Sale, and then on down from there. Now, what's really interesting about this list to me, and one of the reasons why I wanted to start using a lot of this data, is that in the top 20 or so here, and obviously in your screencast you can see the top 22, you've got people like Carlos Martinez, very good stuff, front of the rotation stuff. Chris Sale, one of the best pitchers in baseball. Clayton Kershaw, one of the best pitchers in baseball. Aaron Nola, front of the rotation starter. Noah Syndergaard, elite stuff. Max Scherzer, elite stuff. But then we've also got some other guys here, like Brent Suter, Anibal Sanchez, Zach Wheeler. Uh, you've got Kyle Freeland, Ryan Yarbrough, Miles Mikolas, Trevor Williams, Ross Stripling. A lot of guys that you wouldn't expect to have a lot of success because they don't have that dominant, overpowering stuff. However, what they do is suppress exit velocity. They keep the opposition 
from making really hard contact. So that is a big benefit to them because it allows their fielders to get the balls. It allows their fielders to make plays. And it also allows them to generally keep the ball in the ballpark for the most part. So you've got this average exit velocity column sorted. Then you can also look at fly balls and line drives. Now, of course, here we're looking at the highest end of the spectrum. Clayton Richard, 96.4 miles per hour. Matt Cook, he's since been demoted, 95.8. Jaime Berea, a guy that we talked about as a very significant regression candidate leading up to the All-Star break and certainly a guy I would look to fade in the second half here because he's allowing a lot of hard contact on the batted ball types that are very detrimental. When you think about damage being done, doubles, triples, home runs, you can't hit a home run with a ground ball. You have to hit a fly ball or a line drive. So we see somebody like Berea offering up a lot of hard contact on the batted ball types that are very concerning. Junior Guerra, possibly a regression candidate. You've got other people here like an Ivan Nova, Gio Gonzalez, who's kind of a regression candidate as well. So you can sort by that, but then you can also sort the opposite end of the spectrum and look at the pitchers who are doing a good job of suppressing exit velocity on those fly balls and line drives. Again, we see Brent Suter up there. Ryan Yarbrough, who's one of those guys that's uh, pitching in relief of the opener for the Tampa Bay Rays. If he was a starter, everyone would be talking about him. He's not necessarily a starter, at least not in name, but this is a guy inducing a lot of weak contact. Jacob deGrom, we know he's good. Noah Syndergaard, very good. Eduardo Rodriguez, fantastic. Chris Sale. But again, then you have other guys that you normally wouldn't think of, like an Eric Lauer for the Padres, Tyler Anderson for the Rockies. You know, if you're Tyler Anderson and you're pitching at Coors Field, but you're able to suppress exit velocity on fly balls and line drives, that helps you. It's a big outfield. It's not a great outfield defense. But if you're able to give guys time to get to the baseball when it's hit, that's going to help you in the long run. So that's why this exit velocity stuff, very, very important for a lot of different reasons. Obviously, if you're somebody who allows a lot of hard ground balls, well, those are going to find holes. Fielders have a better chance of getting to a 95 mile per or an 85 mile per hour ground ball than they do a 95 mile per hour ground ball. So that's one of the other additional columns that you can take a look at. But really for me, average exit velocity and fly ball and line drive exit velocity are the two that I really focus on. And then we move over to this column, hard hit percentage. Percentage of balls in play at 95 plus miles per hour. A lot of bad things happen when you hit that 95 mile per hour plus average exit velocity. We talk every Thursday on the betters box about that exit velocity update. Throughout the season, hitters have had about a 516, 517 batting average on balls in play of 95 plus miles per hour and a WOBA in the 630 to 640 range. Those are very bad numbers if you're a pitcher. Again, you're about a 500 hitter. You're a little over a 500 hitter if you put a ball in play at 95 plus miles per hour. So if you're a pitcher that allows a lot of batted balls of that speed or higher, you're going to have a very hard time, unless you're a guy like a James Paxton who can get out of it with a lot of strikeouts. You notice up and down this list here, not a whole lot of strikeout guys, not a whole lot of overpowering guys. You do see Garrett Cole. He throws hard. Sometimes you get the really hard throwers in here. But overall, if you're somebody with a high percentage of 95 plus mile per hour batted balls, you are going to struggle. We look at the list of the lowest percentages of high, of high velocity contact. Ross Stripling, ERA under two. Chris Sale, dominant. Blake Snell, highest left on base percentage in Major League Baseball at 86.3%. Two twenty something ERA. A guy that's having great success this year because he misses bats and because he does not allow hard contact, or he allows a very low percentage of hard contact. So that's why when I talk about taking it to the next level, we used to see, and we still see, a lot of line moves based on low ERAs and high XFIPs. Kyle Freeland is a perfect example of this. Kyle Freeland with an ERA in the 310 range, and XFIP up over four. Well, people are going to bet on him to be a regression candidate. Because that's what we did. Three, four years ago, that's what we did. We looked at ERA and XFIP discrepancy, and then we started making moves based on that 
and a lot of people still do that. However, when you look at Kyle Freeland, he's ninth in percentage of batted balls of 95 plus miles per hour at 28.2%. So this is a guy that stays away from the barrel, stays away from the middle of the hitting zone. So there's more sustainability to him outperforming his FIP, outperforming his XFIP, because he does such a good job of managing contact. So that's where I've taken it to the next level, where yes, the ERA to FIP and ERA to XFIP discrepancies can show you signs of possible regression, but I take it a step further and look at this batted ball data so that I can see, okay, this guy is allowing a lot of hard contact. This guy is going to probably run into some problems. For example, Jaime Berea has a lower ERA and a higher FIP and a higher XFIP. He's allowing a lot of hard contact, 95.8 miles per hour on fly balls and line drives, 38.8% hard hit percentage, you would expect regression from somebody like him much quicker than, say, a Kyle Freeland. So that's why I use this exit velocity data and try to tailor it to my advantage from a handicapping standpoint. So those are the leaderboards. You can find a lot of great information there with those. But let's go ahead and go to the StatCast search page here. Lots of possible data entry situations. Lots of different options that you can pick different things that you can look for. So let's go ahead and every Thursday on the show, as I mentioned already, I look at the batting average league-wide on balls in play of 95 or more miles per hour. So we change the player type to batter. We change sort by to batting average. We change group by to the league. In the metric range, we go to exit velocity, and then we scroll down here to 95. So this query right here will run four hitters the league batting average on batted balls in play with exit velocities of greater than or equal to 95 miles per hour. So we run that query here. And again, like I said, it's been in the 517 range throughout the year. Well, we're up to 520 now. Now, if you want to look on a team specific basis in this group by box, you change from league to team. You search again, and then now you'll see the batting averages for each team with their batted balls of 95 plus miles per hour. So you see here the Dodgers, number one at 554, going all the way down to Kansas City at 482. Once again here, here's the league average of 520. So you can see the teams that have had good successes, good fortunes on high velocity contact, and the teams that have had bad fortunes on high velocity contact and a lot of times you will see teams regress towards the mean of that 520 number of course we see you know here 510 up to 531 that's basically the majority of the league right there in that area right around league average you want to clear the search you go right here it will reset everything for you so let's take a look here for example at we'll look at pitchers who have allowed an exit velocity of 95 or more miles per hour. We'll sort the minimum number of results by 50, so then that way we don't get those guys that have maybe 10 balls in play or something like that. We'll go here to batting average. So again, keep in mind, the batting average league-wide on exit velocities of 95 plus miles per hour is 520. Here we see some of the guys that have had a lot of misfortune and maybe some bad luck on high velocity contact. Addison Reed with a 654 batting average against. Trevor Richards, John Gray, a guy who was actually sent down because of some of the metrics that he had. So you see this list here of the guys that are on the high side. We sort by ascending instead of descending, and we'll see the guys that have had the most success on batted balls of 95 plus miles per hour. Currently on the disabled list, but Michael Waka, 379. We would expect him to regress. Julio Tehran, we would expect him to regress. Seth Lugo, same thing for him. So you can use a lot of this information here to your advantage to try and find some betting angles to look at. One more very quickly. Pitch type, we'll sort by fastballs here. We'll go to batters. We'll go to team. And then we'll go to sort by batting average. These are the teams with the best batting averages on fastballs this season. You see the Chicago Cubs at 296. 
So this is what you can use Baseball Savant for in your handicapping, and hopefully you can find a lot of good betting angles that way.